We talked a little bit about biology, about radiation uh, options. We talked about the tuberplasty. These are all the uh, almost like the adjuvant options of uh, management uh, patients of, with uh, spine tumor issues. And now we'll get a little bit more into the uh, uh, surgical aspect of it. And I'm I'm going to start by you know typically these type of stocks are divided. Um, are divided into primary bone tumors versus metastatic. Uh, and, and these talks are, uh, are generally divided into those categories, and we'll get into it. But before we do that, I wanted to give you some basic principles about just you approach a patient with, uh, a patient with spine cancer. And so this is a more of a principle kind of thing. These are my um, disclosure. And, I, and, and I'm going to start just with this one slide to say that I'm going to start with the complication component aspect of it. And what I mean by that is that when you see patients with spine tumors, I think these are the three things that you have to think about it as surgeons. So this is really going to be more of a surgeon's uh, opinions and approach. One thing is bad timing operation. We always ask ourselves, when is the time to do surgery? And sometimes what you find out is that the timing of surgery is bad. The second thing is that on patients, on, on patients with no diagnosis coming into the emergency room, there is no diagnosis, start doing operations on patients with no diagnosis who have cancer, in general it's a bad idea and I'm going to get into it. And then um, wrong pathology diagnosis, which I'm going to get into it. So be aware of the triple W syndrome, which is the wrong operation on the wrong patient by the wrong surgeon. And so part of these kind of courses is to get you, instead of the three W's, into the three R's, which is the right operation on the right patient by the right surgeon, all right? And I talked the, the three R's and the uh, no and the don't know principle. We know what we know about 10%. We, don't, we know what we don't know, which is about 15%. We don't know what we don't know, which is 75%, maybe even more. And how are we going to convert it from the three W's to the three R, where we are going to do the right operation on the right patient on the right surgeon. Um, so what are the concerns on this patient? So here, a laundry list of problems and things you have to take into consideration before you even think about what to do. They are the elderly population most of the time. They are immunodeficit, right? They are, they are on steroids a lot of times from the previous cancer. They already have issues with rapid weight loss. Um, they are already may have received chemo and radiation and steroids. So there's a lot of things about healing before you even start thinking about surgery. How are you going to deal with the healing yeah, aspect of it? A lot of them are coagulopathic. They are on chemo. The platelet counts may be low. You got to take that into consideration. Wound complications, right? To close those wounds, infection, wound breakdown, very high in these patients. Establish a diagnosis. Right? Sometimes we find ourselves or we end up doing these surgeries on patients we don't have a diagnosis. We have an MRI, we have a CT, they're in the emergency room. We're like, yeah, it looks like a tumor, maybe not. Yes, no. So establishing a diagnosis, um, operating on the right patient, appropriate surgical plane, all of those things. And then, you know, our radiology colleagues, you know, a lot of times we ask them to do a biopsies of a lot of these lesions to figure out what we, we operate on. But keep in mind that when we talk about patients with cancer, we have the primary bone tumors, which are a small component, but it's there. And if you are biopsying these, uh, these areas, you know, you start dealing with contaminated tract, right? The needle itself, as it goes into that sarcoma or chordoma, that track is contaminated, so you have to take those things into consideration. And I've seen patients who are coming in and they've done an unblock resection and the track is still there and it's contaminated and that's where the recurrence is coming from. Um, this patient's unlikely to fuse, right? It's unlike the regular patient population with the trauma, the infection, we pack a lot of bone there, we hope that they're going to fuse. It's rare that you're going to get fusions on patients with, uh, with cancer and so you have the issue with the chemo and the radiation, which goes against your fusion. You talk about poor bone quality. Uh, so there's a lot of issues that you have to think about how will failure. And then the last thing that concerns the timing of surgery. When is a good time to do surgery? 
So let's talk quickly about all these aspects. The patients are immunocompromised, right? They are, they have decreased white cells counts. They have high risk of infection. They have high risk of bad infection, not just the typical staph infection. They have lack of fever response. They have lack of pleocytosis. Um, there's a lot of uh, growth in the vetebroplasty world, and the worst thing you can deal with is infected vetebroplasty. I mean, can you imagine drilling cement that's infected uh, out of, some, of uh, patients who got a vetebroplasty? That's very difficult surgery to do. I mean, it's already hard to remove a vertebrae. Now you're dealing with a vertebrae with cement in, the, in it, and next thing you know, you're taking a very small problem, you're making it a very big problem. Nutrition. Uh, on these patients, again, we talk about significant weight loss, wound coverage, the serum albumin is very low. Uh, so you have to think about, you know, the preoperative nutritional support. Is this patient actually, from a nutrition point of view, able to go through, you know, this type of surgeries? Uh, steroids, right? So steroids, you all know, it's, uh, a lot of these patients are on steroids. Um, there's significant morbidity associated with patients who are on steroids, and the list is right there. So you've got to take that into consideration. The coagulopathy aspect is important. You know, a lot of these patients are thrombocytopenic with a low platelet count. They are non-ambulatory sometimes. They have increased for DVT. You may want to think about prophylactic filter placements. All those things are critical. And then hypervascular tumors, you know, so part of this issue about biopsying and make a diagnosis is just don't forget, a lot of these tumors is not just about taking bone out, as soon as you get into it, it starts bleeding. And so some tumors bleed more, some tumors bleed less. If you think about a renal mat, which tends to be very vascular, you may want to consider doing a preoperative embolization. goes along with what I said, which is biopsy, knowing what it is you're dealing with is very critical. Here is a laundry list of patients with, who are known to be very vascular tumors, the aneurysm of bone cysts, the giant cell tumors, the hemangiomas, anything that has the word heme in it, assume that it's going to be something that's going to bleed on you. And, you know, as surgeons, there's nothing more frustrating when you want to do a great surgery and all you deal with is bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. You can't see and you can't see and you're just dealing with controlling the bleeding. So anything that you can do up front to minimize it, preoperative embolization, whatever it takes would be uh, very helpful. Uh, the renal cells, the liver, the hepatocellular, the thyroid, the pheochromocytomas, melanomas, multiple myelomas. How many of you thought that multiple myeloma is not? It's a very bloody tumor. And the problem with the myelomas is that you can't embolize it, right? It's a bone tumor. You go into that bone and it's just going to keep bleeding and there's not much you can do about it. So likely unsuccessful. Um, and then when it gets to all these uh, preoperative embolization, you know, there's always this aspect of artery of Adamkowitz, right? Where is it? What is, uh, what's the risks of uh, potentially spinal cord infarct and things like that? So that's another set of discussions, um, you know, what to do if you, they end up that they're embolizing a, a lesion and the next level has the artery of Adamkowitz on that side or the level that they want to embolize, the artery of Adamkowitz is right there. How do you handle all those things? Sometimes you get information that you don't want to know, right? Where they're going in to embolize a bloody, tu you know, a vascular tumor for you, and they tell you, hey, by the way, here is the art of Adamkowitz, and it changes your entire surgical plan, maybe. So, um, again, hypervascular tumors, all this embolization is an important concept. So here's an example of a renal mat. You see how vascular these tumors are? Can you imagine getting into this bone and start taking it out? It just non-stop bleeding, right? You want to see it looking like this after they embolize the tumor and that shadow is gone. Wound management, right? So increasing risk of wound complications. Why in these patients? They have the increased age, the altered immune system, they're cachectic, they probably have received previous radiation, so the wound may not heal as well. They get chemotherapy. You have to think upfront about wound management uh, of this patient, and my plastic surgeons are my best buddies, right, because I, I call them a lot. Um, so all of those things, previous radiation point, avoid midline incision, decrease retractant time, vigorous radiation, these are a lot of things that you can do up front to minimize uh, wound breakdown. Cervical thoracic incisions, every case that I do with a cervical thoracic incision requires cervical thoracic instrumentation, 
I go ahead and ask the plastic surgeons to close it. There's a huge amount of tension on that area and there's a high rate of wound breakdown. So I even if they've not been radiated, I will get the plastic surgeons to come by and do the flaps to minimize the wound breakdown. So plastic surgery, flap closure is very critical for these patients. You know, here is a patient where I've done an unblock resection. These are big surgeries. By the time the tumor is out, you need your plastic colleagues to be able to come in there and close this wound. You can't finish the surgery without these guys involved. Here is a patient with sarcoma of the back of his neck. You know, the idea is, is to resect all this out. And here's another one with sarcoma. They're just going right through the skin. These are all going to be unblocked resection with huge opening defect. Here's what's left by the time this is all over. Spinous pus has been resected. All the muscles have been resected. You need your plastic surgeons. This is a multidisciplinary surgeries to be able to close this wound for you. And here's the specimen. Again, another one of those cases where by the time you're done with the case, you need to be able to close these wounds. And there are multiple ways of how we go about doing it. This is a, a flap that's being taken from the front, and uh, this is a myocutaneous flap from the rectus muscle. This flap is, before we even do the surgery, the patients are in their supine position. The flap is being taken, being placed in a cellophane wrap, really placed in the belly, the wound is closed, and that, that's gonna be pulled out through the back. And you can see right here that that flap that was taken from the front, once the sacrectum is being done, is getting pulled out through the back, once there's a big opening there, and then that flap from the front is being used to close the flap from the back. Again, it requires a lot of planning. So surgical planning, before you even start talking about metastatic versus primary, all of those things, you have to think about what's, what exactly are you planning on doing. Are you planning on curing these patients of cancer? Are you planning on palliating this patient from this cancer because of pain or neurological deficits? What type of surgery are you going to do? Are you going to do an arm block resection where you take everything out without entering the tumor, without spilling it to the surrounding? Or are you doing an intralesional resection where you are actually, are you actually spreading the tumor around by resecting it? You have to think about biomechanical consideration. Where are you going to instrument? How are you going to instrument? How level above? How many level below? What's the wound status of this patient, right? When it comes to be able to close it at the end. And then, what is the medical status of this? Can a patient actually go through this surgery? And that's where you rely on your medical oncologist to help you with that. So, when we talk about these goals, when we talk about our planning, you have to talk about what type of tumor we're talking about. And so for a primary tumors, primary I mean bone tumor, right? The chordomas, the sarcomas, and we'll get into it in a minute. Really your goal, if you can, is to cure the patient of cancer. And the nice thing for us as surgeons is that when it comes to cancer, there's a not, not a lot of opportunities out there for somebody to say, I'm gonna do this surgery, you have cancer, and by the time this surgery is over, you're cured of cancer. So that's such a, an amazing tool that we have an opportunity to actually offer patients uh, the chance to be cured of this cancer. And this is really for the primary bone tumors where their the goal is cure or potentially long-term survival. That's unlike the patients with metastatic disease where we are talking about palliation, right? So whether it's pain, whether it's a neurological deficit, we are not there to cure the patient of the cancer. We are there to actually improve their quality of life. And I'll get into it in more details. You have to think about adjuvant therapy, right? What we do as surgeons is useless if we don't know what's the adjuvant therapy options that are available. Unfortunately for patients with primary bone tumor, very limited uh, options for patients with adjuvant therapy, right? The chemotherapy options, not that great. Radiation therapy options, not that great. And so really it boils down to, in a primary tumor, surgical intervention. The metastatic, there's tons of uh, adjuvant therapy that's available, and you have to look at it and say, is it something we should actually treat with adjuvant therapy instead of uh, surgery? The surgical technique for the two type of tumors is different. The primary bone tumors, if you can do an unblock resection, do it, and we'll get into it in a second. The metastatic, really, it's mostly intralesional resection. So the biopsy, the diagnosis, right, the establishing the diagnosis 
is critical. And if you have to take one thing out of our talks here today, one thing, that would be it. And that is know what it is that you're operating on. And so the biopsy component of it, when it comes to our colleagues in radiology, interventional radiology is critical because we want to know what is the diagnosis. We want to know what it is that we, op we, we are operating or not operating on. Because why? That will tell us everything. That will tell us what's the potential response to therapy. That will give us staging and on and on and on. So here's a patient who came to see me for a second opinion, was scheduled, came to see me on a Wednesday, scheduled for an unblock resection at another institution for a secrectomy. And this was read as a sacral chordoma. The reason why a biopsy was not recommended on this particular patient was because the surgeon felt that the track will be contaminated. And because the track is going to be contaminated and this is going to be an arm block resection, that particular surgeon did not want to do a biopsy because he was worried that the track is going to be contaminated. And even though we're going ahead and do a secrectomy, the track is going to be contaminated. And so the recommendation was to proceed with an arm block resection and take it out. The patient comes for a second opinion and I said, do a biopsy. And we'll deal with the track We'll figure out a way to where the biopsy is going to be made so that we can take the sacrum with the track in one piece. And so that's where what the Dr. Gerson was talking about, this collaboration with the people you're working with. I will not just send this patient to my radiology colleague and say, just go ahead and do the biopsy. I will actually tell them where and how I want them to do the biopsy so that if I were to do a secrectomy, that biopsy track with the sacrum will come out together. That biopsy, you see the slide there on the right side. Anybody recognize what this slide is from your pathology days? This is an ependymoma. You see there was that cells. This was a mixopapillary ependymoma that eroded through the sacrum, required completely different surgery. This is not a surgery that needs a secrectomy at all. Right, so here's a patient who's scheduled to get a secrectomy for a presumed chordoma. It's not a chordoma, it's a mixopapillary ependymoma. Makes a huge difference. So I'm focusing on that biopsy. I'm focusing on what these radi radiologists are going to do. And when a radiologist, and call, tell me if I'm wrong, um, any input would be valuable. Radiologists, when they do a biopsy, they look for the path of least resistance and the shortest path they can get there. They don't want to take a long path there. They want to say, okay, what's the shortest way I can get into doing a biopsy? And the thing about it is that when you look at something like this and you have two, a big mass in the neck, where do you think the radiologist, how are they going to biopsy that thing? You wouldn't be surprised to find out on the picture on the left that that radiologist may put the needle through the mouth. Right? That mass is extending right behind the whole pharynx. That's the shortest path to get into this mass. Or on the picture on the right, big mass in the sacrum, they may do a transrectal biopsy. They'll get you the diagnosis, but what is the problem with these tracts? You can't resect them. You can't take them out with your surgery. And so you can do a major big surgeries on all of these two masses, but the tract itself left behind through a transoral approach it's going to come back through the track. Or if it's transrectal approach, you're not going to take the rectum out, right, to do a secrectomy. That track is going to be contaminated. So if you let the radiologist dictate how they're going to do a biopsy, you're going to be in trouble. And that's part of the reason why that other surgeon didn't want to let the radiologist do it, because he didn't know how they're going to do the biopsy. You have to communicate with your radiologist to say, I want you to do it that way. And, what a, and here is an example. You can see right here, um, let's see how this thing works here. This, uh, anyway, you can see right here, um, here's the track. You see it right here? You can see it right there. We mark the track, and then we lift everything around the track, so then we can remove the sacrum, right? We remove the sacrum with the track in one piece. And so, when you actually guide them how to do their biopsy, make sure that you tell them that you make their track very close to the midline so that you can actually take it with a specimen. Otherwise, if they put it very lateral, you're not getting there with your surgery. Their track stays. Or if it's transrectal, their track stays. So it's very important that you tell them stay in the midline, 
CT guided core close to the midline, discuss it with the radiologist to make sure that you can actually plan your surgery around the biopsy track. Otherwise, all that big surgery that you do is for nothing. There is a 100% guarantee, not 90, 100% guarantee of recurrence. All right, if you muck around with these tumors or you spread it somewhere, it's just going to come back. Um, so why do we want a CT-guided biopsy? Because an open biopsy, you may, do, you may risk contamination, there are sampling errors, so this is really the way to do it. So I'm spending all this time talking about the biopsy because diagnosis is critical and the way to do it is even more critical. Timing of surgery, when to do surgery, right? So here is a 65-year-old gentleman coming to the emergency room with eight hours of bowel and bladder incontinence. Radiology call you urgently, severe sacral root compression with large tumor. And that is, that is, uh, that is your history here. And here is the MRI, right? So this patient shows up to the emergency room. I go back to the history here. Lost control of his bowel and bladder. And, and you see this huge mass, right? Now, if you are in a major academic centers, the radiologist may help you to say, here is my differential diagnosis. But you'd be surprised to see how many times you're there. And you have to kind of make a call on it. And you know what are you going to do? on Friday night at midnight when this guy shows up to the emergency room, lost control of the bowel and bladder. Here's a 65-year-old coming to the emergency room, has a little bit of weakness in the shoulder for 72 hours. And you see this lesion inside the cord, compressing, this is an intradural lesion, compressing the spinal cord on a patient with three days history of progressive weakness in his, in his shoulder. You know. You have no diagnosis. You don't know what you're dealing with. Should you try to preserve function? Should you do a biopsy? Where are you going with this? We got a PET scan. The PET scan was highly active. And I'm going to get into this case in a second. Here's a 23-year-old female coming with one month's history of back pain. On the day of presentation, she stood up, noticed an acute onset of back pain. Neurologically, just a little bit of weakness in her legs, about four out of five strengths. And here's the MRI. She's in the emergency room, acute onset of back pain, a little bit of weakness in her back, four out of five strengths. The cord is severely squashed by something. It's wrapping around the spinal cord. And you get called. And you have to make a call. And you know what? It's up to you. And that's the crazy thing about a lot of these cases. You're the one who makes the call. There's not going to be anybody else who's going to make it for you. It's up to you as a surgeon who get called to see this patient to know how to take it from there. And it's a difficult thing. It's not simple. And what I mean by that is that when you have somebody who has a little bit of weakness, I'm not talking about the conventional just back pain, you can kind of wait, but a little bit of weakness, you know, where are you going with this? You know, how long can you wait? Here's few more pictures, and you can see, again, severe cord compression on this patient, and a lytic lesion looks suspicious for cancer. You don't even have a diagnosis of cancer, right? This patient was taken to surgery, had a laminectomy done by the surgeon, and you can see the spinal cord has been decompressed, a laminectomy was done, and that's what the MRI looks like after the surgery. This was patient was taken from the emergency room emergently to the operating room to get a decompression. And guess what? The patient got better. The weakness, four out of five strengths in the leg, got better. The back pain, a little better. And that's what it looks like. You see there's still a lot of stuff around the spinal cord, the spinal uh, vertebral body, right? All this stuff here, that's all tumor. This is tumor, right? But some of the compression of the spinal cord got better, and that's why the patient neurologically recovered function. Take this same patient that I just showed you, came in with a little bit of weakness, and now make him, let's say that he came in and it's two out of a severe weakness in the legs. Two out of five, barely, not even anti-gravity. Where are you going with that? Are you going to do the same surgery? You're not going to do the same surgery? So you can see that there is a lot of decision making that has to be made by you 
when you go down there and evaluate this patient. Here's a 51-year-old back pain, bilateral, severe left leg pain, comes in with one week history of progressive foot weakness with intermittent bowel bladder function. So this is, this is a guy who comes in with a lot of weakness and there's the MRI. You can see the MRI shows a big sacral lesion. The canal is full of stuff. It's picking up the nerve roots in the canal. There is a reason why these patients have foot weakness. Clearly, there's something there severely pressing the nerve root and is presenting with severe neurological deficit. Right? What are you going to do? You're going to take him to surgery, to decompress it, to salvage, to try and preserve the deterioration, the neurological status, get the function back. You know, you can see it right here. This patient was taken emergently to surgery because of this foot weakness and underwent intralesional debulking and lumbopelvic fixation. <coughs> and the biopsy came back as primary bone tumor, chondrosarcoma. So this is a primary bone tumor that needed a non-block resection. Ended up getting an intralesional resection. The tumor is spread. So this was followed by radiosurgery six weeks later. And guess what? This patient got better after the surgery because the canal has been opened, the nerve root has been decompressed, the foot function got better, his pain got better. The patient's doing great clinically. The patient is coming back three years later and is coming in with this picture after the surgery. What is that? So he comes to see me, actually, and he says, Doc, one of my screws is poking up, it's coming out, it's getting loose. Right? And that's what he's pointing at. He's pointing to this hard thing that's kind of uh, pushing on, coming up right there. That's not a screw. Right? That's not a screw coming out. And the MRI shows severe tumor recurrence in the canal. All the stuff that was there before, it's now back in there. And that lesion that you saw on the back is this thing right here, right? It's this thing ready to come out. That is not a screw. What is that? What is that? It's a, it's a recurrence, right? I mean, this is, this is what happened. You get short, temporary relief of the symptoms. Patient's happy because the pain is better, the foot function is better, but it comes at a huge cost because that patient's going to be in a worse situation within months, years, whatever it takes. And that's what happened here. Not only did that is now in the canal and now it's spread in the muscles and everywhere else, but the rods are broken. Right? The rods is, is broken, um, it's not holding, and that's also causing pain. And so where do you go from here? So he comes to see me and the cat is out of the bag. I can kind of fix things, fix the rod, and I can take the lesion out, and on and on and on. So when you talk about these basic principles of management of patients with spine tumors, that is what I'm talking about. Right, so the type of patients, the issues you have to think about before you even get into the surgeries. Um, so let's talk now a little bit about these two groups, right? So we talk about the primary bone tumors, here they are. These are the difficult ones, right? They are less, much less common, but these are the ones you really need to know what to do. With a metastatic, you have some wiggle rooms, but the primary bone tumors, each one of them is very different, and a lot of them require different management schemes. So the giant cell tumor could be different than the aneurysmal bone cysts, the chordomas, the chondrosarcomas, and you really need your medical oncologist to help you, all right? Primary bone tumors, if they need surgery, this is what you have to think about. On block resection, you take a vertebra, you don't get into it, you don't spread it around, you take that vertebrae, whatever you can do, figure out a way to detach it, spread it away from the spinal cord, and then get it out of there. Keep the tumor intact within its capsule, don't spread it. Unblock. Here is a patient with sarcoma. You can see that the tumor is in the body, it's in the pedicle, it's in the travis process, it's a little bit in the canal. Can you do an unblock resection here? Because what is the key here? The spinal cord, right? How are you gonna, how are you gonna 
get that thing off the spinal cord without hurting the patient. Each case requires different planning. This is not a conventional surgery. You have to think about, is it actually possible to separate that tumor away from the spinal cord without hurting the spinal cord and for me to be able to remove all, you want that picture on the right to be like that, right? You got all this tumor out away from the spinal cord and the spinal cord is intact, you have not hurt the patient and you can actually feasibly do it. Can you actually feasibly not entering this tumor and resect it? So here's the MRI and where are you going to make your cuts, right? I'm not going to get too much into it, but here is the planning, right? The cuts are going to be made here and here. The right side portion all can be removed. There's no tumor there. The idea is get everything released, okay, in such a way that then when you make your cuts, you can deliver this vertebral body out, okay, without being able, without interrupting the tumor. And you can see that tumor is all encapsulated. Nothing has been, nothing has been interrupted. That requires a lot of thinking, a lot of planning, and a lot of surgical expertise, to be honest with you. Right? There's no way around it. Here is a codoma, right? Here is a codoma. Same thing, right? How are you going to take this massive tumor out, figure out a way where you're going to make those cuts not to get into the tumor, right? You want the picture looking like this. That vertebra, that sacrum was removed out. The entire tumor is sitting in the front there. And you can see that tumor is in the canal. This is canal, sacral canal, right? All of this tumor is extending into the sacral canal. It's not just in the front. The entire sacral canal is full of tumor. So how are you going to do this? You want to, you know, so a lot of time with these cases, we use navigation to make sure that we know where we are, where we're making our cuts. We don't want to make cuts that enter the tumor. We want to make sure that all of our cuts are done in such a way that we are around the tumor itself. And there's some pictures here that I'm just kind of showing. And then you have to think about fusion. Okay, so you went and you did this massive surgery to take this tumor out, and you're, you're doing it to try and cure the patient. Then now you have to think about fusion. Right? Because if you're going for curing these patients to live for the rest of their life, unlike the metastatic where if they don't fuse, the life expectancy is such that fusion may not be an issue, for this patient fusion is an issue. It's a critical issue. You want to make sure that you maximize the chance of fusion so that you don't deal with broken rods, broken screws, and on, on, and on. You've got to think about it. This is one of the cases that I've done with a huge, you know, lumbopelvic chondrosarcoma, how are you going to fuse something like that? When half the pelvis is coming off and, and, you know, how are you going to get there to be able to get that fusion? And there are a lot of tricks. Again, very individualized uh, planning. Here we actually sacrifice the leg. This patient presented with leg weakness. And we actually use, this is a patient in the lower position. The head is on the right. The leg has been taken off, but we use these bones within the left leg. This is the femur, and this is the fibula, and you can see these are vascularized graft that we're going to bring over to close, to pack, to do whatever it takes to get the fusion to occur. And this is amazing how quickly this thing works. If you get the patient's own bone, vascularized bone graft, and we actually have learned it from our orthopedic colleagues. As neurosurgeons, we didn't really pay attention to fusion too much, but our orthopedic <sighs> colleagues helped us with that, right? They do it a lot when it comes to all these vascularized bone graft, and we can now use it in our resections to maximize the chance of fusion. And I, we ended up publishing it, uh, you know, reconstruction of pelvic, lumbar pelvic junction, utilizing two vascularized autologous bone grafts after arm block resections. How we do it. And you can see right here in the picture on the left where we not only utilize the femur and the tibia vascularized bone, but in fact we'll use the skin flaps. The plastic guys will use the flaps from the leg to be able to close these massive openings. And we'll build models. And in our lab, we have a Spine Research Institute at Ohio State, we can create these models where we can actually do these surgeries before we do the surgeries and then reconstruct them, and then figure out where is the weakest points of these constructs 
to be able to predict where this is going to break, how high to go, how low to go, all of those things are things that we're thinking about so that when you go with this marathon of a surgery, you maximize all the chances of uh, fixing this. And that's just some of those pictures. Vertebral artery issues, when you're dealing with these tumors in the neck, there's another issue when it comes to the vertebral artery. A lot of these tumors can wrap around the vertebral artery. How are you going to handle that? Here is a case of echondrosarcoma. You can see there's some tumor involving some of the nerve roots. One vertebral artery is completely involved, so you can't separate that artery from the that artery has to go with the tumor. You can see, here's the tumor. The artery goes right through it. You're going to have to take, if you want to do a non-blocker section, that tumor with this vertebral artery comes with it. And what does that mean? Right? You can see the tumor right here with the three-dimensional reconstruction. First of all, when you look at it, can you do a non-block? Can this patient go through with this surgery to the point that you can take the vertebral artery with it? And there's some pictures, um, intraoperative pictures over here, where we go about doing this type of surgeries. And you know, we'll coil the vertebral artery, we take into consideration, we do angiograms before the stages to make sure that the, the only vertebral artery that's left doesn't go into any spasm or anything like that. There's a lot of nuances that goes along with it. Because just remember, when you take one vertebral artery and you do these surgeries on a patient who has only one vertebral artery, that vertebral artery better stays patent. patent. Otherwise, it's over, right? So. We'll do angiograms between the stages to make sure that one vertebral artery is okay and there's nothing wrong with it. CSF leak. How often in your practice do you go and you cut nerves and you ligate thecal sacs? There's actually a technique of how to ligate a thecal sac. Right? We, this is a procedure that's rarely being done. It goes against our genes as surgeons to cut nerves and to ligate sacs and things like that. Here is I'm ligating the thecal sac here. It's a balloon full CSF, and you have to get all the way around it and then tie it over. It's not like tying an over. It's actually not that easy to do, and you've got to minimize that issues of, uh, of flu fluid leak and things like that. And there are multiple ways of dealing with it if it does happen, and you guys know it, because it, it can happen on any case we do. But ultimately, the key about all these leaks is that you've got to be aggressive up front. Don't let anything... Don't think that by putting a little stitch sometime or by putting a little bit of fibrin glue, it's going to fix it. You've got to be very aggressive, whether it's the lumbar drain, whether it's get plastic surgery involved, whatever it takes, because you can get behind the eight ball on CSF leak very quickly. Um, so just a few words about it. Again, immediate repair, primary repair is critical. Patch, glue, flap closure, vascularize, on and on and on. Lumbar drain, whatever it takes, be very aggressive with those CSF leaks. There's nothing more frustrating with going through these big surgeries. You do all your flap, whatever it is, and then you start seeing CSF coming through all these big openings. Opening those wounds would be very difficult. So got to be very aggressive. We mentioned the vertebroplasty kyphoplasties. Peter have talked about it extensively. Um, and we have published a lot about this when it comes to management schemes for these patients. I wanted to talk a little briefly about these contraindications that Peter mentioned. And that is that um, there's a lot of lists out there that talk about when not to do vertebroplasties, right? So too much fracture, very collapse, bone in the canal, and the lists are numerous. And in a patient like this, two vertebrae are broken, they're pressed against the spinal cord, these patients are in massive amount of pain. They can't get out of bed. I mean, they're bedridden when you go and see them. They can't get out of bed. And when you look at something like this, that fits the contraindications, right? There's bone in the canal. What do we worry about? We worry about cement leaking into the canal. We worry about the cement ending up where these bone fragments are, right? So that's where a lot of these things saying you got height loss more than 70%, you got something like this where the back wall is missing, you see? When you look at a CAT scan, that back wall is missing. What's the likelihood that you inject cement here and it's going to leak right through? There's nothing here. There's nothing here to hold the cement there. So I always get a CAT scan because I like to see what's going on with that back wall. What's the likelihood of cement leaking 
to the canal because the back wall is missing, right? And that's, that's one of those criteria for contraindication. If the posterior wall is missing, don't do it, right? So when should you do it? You don't want something like this, right? Here is cement in the canal. It does happen. We'll get a lot of referrals on patients with cement in the canal. And it happens, and the patient, a lot of times, are actually not symptomatic. We find it incidentally. Oh, by the way, there is cement in the canal. But sometimes they are. And it's hard to deal with because to drill cement is a problem. It's not an easy thing to do. So here's a patient who fits all these contraindications, right? 60-year-old, bad fracture, coat compression, um, but cannot have a vertebrectomy. She has constrictive malignant pericardial effusion. She is really rendered non-surgical candidate. This patient is bedridden, right? And you can see there's a little bit of a bone fragment in the canal. It, we ended up injecting this patient. I think it was like the first case report that's been de that we kind of start looking at all these contraindicated patients. And we actually saw, this was presented, uh, published in the Journal of uh, Spinal Disorder Technique. You can see a little bit of cement there in that very bad broken body. But it's an amazing thing how that little cement make a huge difference in the patient's quality of life. And that patient literally can, went from 10 out of 10 pain to 0 out of 10 pain, able to sit, stand, just from that procedure. Which led us to this paper that said, all these contraindications, there is some wiggle room here, all right? And we can refute some of those proposed contraindications. Guess why? Because a lot of the patients that we get called on, the patients with the cancer, they have no other options. They cannot go through big surgery. They can go get, cannot get complete big vertebrectomies, but they are, the quality of life is terrible. They, they have a broken back. There's a little bit of compression over the spinal cord, and they cannot move. The pain is so severe. And here you got this procedure where should we just say we're not going to do it because there is bone compressing the spinal cord, there is some absence of the posterior wall to say, well, we're not going to do it because it meets, meets those contraindications. And so that's where we start looking at to say there is wiggle room. Even though there is some of those proposed contraindications, there's ways sometimes to go about doing this. And our conclusion was that relative contraindications can be relaxed in patient without other option, with no clinical significance uh, increase in complications. And that's where it gets to what we talked about, where this patient needs to be looked at by us. Because the intervention list, the pain guys, the guys who do these procedures, they, will, they may say, can't be done. Not doing it. Meets the criteria, I'm not doing it, right? You gotta go there and see the patient, see the amount of pain that they are. Can they get out of bed? Can they not? There is a clinical component, clinical evaluation that you go through it to say, and then a discussion with the patient to say, listen, you have absence of the wall, you got 70% collapse. This is, I call it high risk vertebroplasties, right? This is gonna be a high risk injection. We think we can do it, but you have to buy into it. Right? If you want to give this a chance, there is a higher chance of cement leakage, but we think it's worth it because the, you don't have any other options. And Ulus here, who's my fellow, will tell you, I have this discussion with a lot of these patients. I, I, I do exactly what I just told you. I said, you got bone in the canal, you have absence of the posterior wall, you have more than 70% collapse, you can't get out of bed, you're in a lot of pain, and there's a lot of tricks that we can do when it comes to how we inject it the thickness of it, where to inject it, and we find out that you don't necessarily have to fill up the entire vertebral body all the way to the back wall. Sometimes, you know, just injecting enough to the front will be good enough for a patient who has two months life expectancy or three months life expectancy, and it makes a huge difference. I'm presenting this case, ectopic extramedullary hematopoiesis, because sometimes, you know, patients and I want to get into it in a second, patients that come to see me, they come for arm block resections and they don't need any resections. And I'm getting back to when you get to management of a lot of these patients, the management has to be individualized. Every patient is different. 
it has to be a multidisciplinary, right? You have to, this is, you don't make this decision in vacuum. You gotta get your colleagues, and that's why spine tumor boards, things like that are very critical. You wanna optimize preoperative status, whatever it is you need to do, whether it's putting a filter, whether it's to embolize it, whether it's to uh, feed them, you know, get the albumins to where they need to be. You wanna think about appropriate surgical strategy. Are you gonna do a non-block or are you gonna do an intralesional resection? You wanna anticipate wound problems, all right? All those things are important. Here is a case on a non-block secrectomy. This is a picture from my operating, right? This is what happens. You need to have a lot of people involved with a lot of these cases to be able to pull it through.